Skaggs, and with me in the TARDIS, everybody's favorite partner in time, certainly mine, Jesse Jackson. Hello, Charles. And you know, I always, you always say that, and I want to make sure everyone knows yeah. you are my favorite companion in time as well, Charles. There is no one I would do this with except you. Why, well, you old softy, you. Right. Uh, I'm, I'm, fe- I'm feeling a little verklempt right now. Well, I will tell you, because, um, you know, most shows, uh, podcasts that I do are about a TV series. You know, once the current season ends, that's it. You kind of do a follow up and you move it on. You come back the next year. Right. And um, and I I really appreciate the fact that you know during the off season we try to every couple of weeks cover the history of the Doctor and the different um you know the we do a wide range of stories and so it's always fun and i would tell you if it wasn't if you weren't my partner i would probably yeah. say look let's just you know let's let's shelve the doctor Take a break. podcast and we'll we'll get back right before it's going but you make it so much fun i try to i hope yeah. everybody's out there is having fun as well yeah um but uh so yeah um there, there it's just that there's so much rich tapestry to doctor who um, it's been around for now, going on 55 years this yes. November, if you can believe it. Um, so we'll have to do something special for that. Yeah. And um, that, uh, you know, with all the, the related uh, spinoffs and big finish audios, there's just – there's this, this big open field to just rummage through Yeah. in, in the off season. So obviously when the TV series – TV series of returns. We're going to obviously talk about the new episodes, but it's just great to have all this stuff we can go to and still kind of keep things going in the in the off season. Yeah, and I appreciate as we talk about this, you know, you do the heavy lifting on this. <laughs> um, you know, I and I think it works out a good partnership. Um, you kind of figure out what we're going to talk about. I do the editing, and then yep. we both talk about the episode. But you know. Um, and you keep me and you keep me in line. So well, that's good. <laughs> um, I did want before we move to our episode, I did need to share a real world story with you. Oh, story time! Yes, yeah, so I, I'm at my uh, desk, and my um, background is the new um, logo right. of you know the new beautiful logo with Jodie Whittaker as the Doctor silhouette, you know, in the TARDIS. I, I just think that's I, a beautiful graphic. I re- speaking of the new logo, I really like the new logo. Yes, I do too. I think it's very I think it's very stylish um, and just completely differentiates from the the past the previous logo. And a nice and it's almost kind of a nice throwback to the original two thousand five logo. Yes. With it with the gold and this you know tint to it. Yeah. The coloring to it, so I like that a lot. So my boss, Joel, said, oh, that's right. You like Doctor Who, don't you? And I go, yes, I do. He said, who do you think's the best doctor? And I said, you know, that's a complicated question, Joel. I, you know, what you tend to say is who's your favorite doctor, um, which is mine's David Tennant. Right. I, I said, but you can certainly make the argument that, you know, uh, John Pertree had one of the biggest barriers because 
um, you know, he had he was the first one to take over. And then I said, and Christer Eccleson had the whole burden. You of, mean Patrick Chow? You mean yeah, Patrick, Patrick Chow? Yeah, thank you. Um, You're welcome. And then, you know, Eccleson had the whole issue of, okay, don't mess it up, right? I'm, we're bringing this back. And so he said, well, my daughter has really become – a huge Matt Smith fan. She just watches, she's watched all the Matt Smith episodes and she hasn't figured out which ones to watch next. And I, I told her that, um, and I, I said, well, I'll send you a couple episodes of older episodes. I said, if she can get past the black and white, because I know a lot of younger people, that's a barrier. I said, right. but, but I said the Jamie and the Doctor are really fun episodes, and Matt Smith based a lot of his, you know, work on that. And then I also, um, I said, is she excited about the new Doctor being a woman? He goes, oh, she's very excited. So I just thought that was kind of nice that, um, you know, his daughter's is mid-teens. Yeah, and I, I, it's one. It's always good to hear a new generation becoming uh, doctor fans, and right. also as two middle-aged guys, you know, I don't think we can understand how there is a whole generation out there that are just so excited about this latest chapter. So, just thought I'd bring that up for a minute and share a real-world uh, Doctor Who discussion. Yeah, I'm hoping to live kind of vicariously through my nieces with um, with this new the new Thirteenth Doctor, uh, yeah. Jodie Whittaker, because I and, and you know like obviously with I'm sure there are a lot of um, women out there that just you know they're Doctor Who fans, but this is the Doctor that's going to best represent them maybe, and uh, and hopefully this just kind of gives a gives the uh, the fandom a nice big um, influx of maybe, you know, like returning viewers and also new viewers. So I'm hoping that will happen as well. Yeah, and one last point, then we'll move to our actual episode discussion. Right, right. You and we, have, I, we haven't forgotten, no, honest. You and I being, um, you know, Who fans, we're excited every new Doctor. It, it doesn't matter to us who it's right. going to be. We're excited to see this new actor take on this role that we love. So we're, you know, we, I don't know if we can get even more excited. Like we're already up to 11 <laughs> to quote Spinal Tap, right? We're, we're, Sh shouldn't we be up to 13? <laughs> ah, very nice. See what, see what I did there? Yes, you did. And so that's why I say it's kind of neat to see – uh, someone that perhaps would have been a casual fan or someone who maybe never had been a fan, the excitement right. of that. And so it's very good. So, yeah, I'm looking yeah. forward to it. And hopefully everybody is out there as well. So, and so, hopefully you'll be here with us as we cover the new episodes later in some, this fall. Uh, so this week, but before, yes, let me, let me give you this. Speaking right. of fluid genders. Yes. We yes. have a story to talk about that today. Oh, I see what you did there. You, 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 yeah, I, I apologize for stepping all over your segue there because uh, that was a very nice segue. Thank you, Charles. Uh, respect on that one. So, yes, we're going to talk about here in episode 109, The Sword of the Chevalier. And, of course, you may be going, wait, I don't remember that TV episode. Well, as we talked about last time, uh, we are covering the uh, Big Finish Audio Adventure set, The Tenth Doctor Adventures Volume 2, starring David Tennant and Billy Piper as The Tenth Doctor and Rose Tyler. Once again, back together again, only in audio form. And um, this was written by John Dorney and directed by Nicholas Briggs. And this is the second of the three CDs, so we're going to wrap uh, the set up next time. And... Uh, Jesse, there's a there's a few notable guest stars in this, uh, mostly from Big Finish Audios, but there's a couple of uh, little interesting trivia bits I want to run past you. Oh, nice. Okay, so uh, real quick, before as we we kind of overview things, uh, Nicholas Grace, who plays the Chevalier de Aeon, uh, he is most notable if you watch the um, 
Doctor Who mini episode, Death is the Only Answer. That's the one with um, Albert Einstein. Well, he played Albert Einstein. Wow. Okay. So uh, that's him. Uh, that's where he's most notable from, from Doctor Who. He also has played the Time Lord Straxus in a number of Big Finish audio, Doctor Who audios. Um, so he's kind of recurring in that. And uh, he was actually um, a prog spy in an episode of the Young Indiana Jones Chronicles, which I thought was kind of cool. Oh, nice. If you're a bit, I was a fan of that show back in the day. Uh, Mark Elstob, who plays uh, the dual role of Joxer, and also he plays the butler. Well, he was uh, the characters, uh, the editor and the old man in the War Doctor audio adventure uh, from Big Finish, Pretty Lies. And he was also a character named Herr Grau in a Torchwood Big Finish audio called The Dying Room. Uh, we had Tam Williams, who played the schoolboy in uh, that's the Sylvester McCoy TV episode, Remembrance of the Daleks. So he was actually in a Doctor Who, classic Doctor Who episode, way back when as a boy. And uh, he's also played a character named Tom in a Sixth Doctor uh, Big Finish audio called Point of Entry. And most notably, he was um, he appeared in the movie Spectre, the James Bond movie Spectre. So we have another Bond connection, where he played Money Penny's boyfriend. Nice. So there's a little Easter egg for you. And uh, Lucy Briggs Owen, who plays Hempel. The dancer and Duchess, the Duchess in this, uh, she was most noble when we talked about the War Doctor, Big Finish Audio Adventure, The Innocent. That was the very first one. She played the character Rejoice, who is the War Doctor's sort of companion that kind of nurses him back to health in that, if you remember I that do. story. So, uh, so here she is again, only this time as a baddie. Okay. And, and she also played a character named Tina Anderson. In a third Doctor, Big Finish Audio, The Havoc of Empires, and she played Miranda in a seventh Doctor, Big Finish Audio, The Maker of Demons. So if you Good. want to check So uh, a few uh, – pretty – I mean, like I said, most of these are from Big Finish Audios, but there's a couple little interesting uh, movie and TV trivia bits here. Yeah, uh, they have made – you know, Big Finish Audio has its – uh, cast of characters, you know, kind of a a uh, theater group, right? So that's kind of cool. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. The way Big Finish seems to do it is that they seem to reward their actors that they like. Um, maybe they start off as very minor characters in other audio adventures or spinoffs, you know, like Gallifrey series or whatnot, and then they kind of promote them to like more notable characters in like the major higher profile uh, Doctor Who audios, which I think is kind of interesting. Yes. Which is which they did here. So uh, unless they or unless they're just looking for someone very specific uh, to play a certain character, of course. All right. So um, let's get into the main discussion. Now I had a lot of trouble with coming up with titles for this one for for um, for themes for the, our segment. So I'm just going to just dive into the subject okay. matter because uh, it's kind of tough to come up with um, references that relate to a, uh, a 18th century uh, French uh, <laughs> androgynous uh, swords master. So swords. Okay. Yeah. And uh, so without actually making a three musketeers reference, because that's just so cliche, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, let's talk about our first topic. I'm going to talk about the the Tenth Doctor and Rose, of course. Um, what did you think of the Tenth Doctor and Rose in their second audio adventure together, Jesse? Um, this episode seemed to work. I like this one better than the last episode right. we discussed. I, yeah, I Infamy think, of the Zeros, yeah. Yeah. Um, we got – I felt like there was plenty of chemistry – the previous episode, but this one even more so. Um, there's a lot of give and take. Um, you know, the whole doctor wanting ice cream, and then that was I'm, fun. Wasn't I'm going to take you someplace great, and they see this ancient uh, telescope, and he's fascinated with it, and she's like, "Really? You promised me all this greatness, and you're taking me there." 
Um, that was just a lot of fun. Um, I am, it, it may be a cliche, Charles, but one of my favorite points is when the villain, the big bad, yeah. is, um, tells the companion, well, you know, the doctor could be dead or the doctor is going to find his trouble. And the companion, no matter who it is, right. the whole, um, yeah, you don't know who you're messing with. Right. <laughs> you all, know? The, all defy it and you're yeah, just going just like, disbelieving. Yeah, and... go ahead. You know, but I will tell you, this is not. Uh, and I just kind of love when that happens. Uh, I love that confidence. And it is just – so it was good to see them both. Um, and I actually uh, – I, I know you'll get to that in a minute. Yeah. But I loved the kind of um, – you know, their other companion. They were a good trio this time. Yeah, I, 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 I agree. Um, I thought the Tenth Doctor and Rose had better chemistry in this one than they did in the first one. I totally yes. agree with you on that. Um, I like that Rose was kind of teasing the Doctor more in this episode. Yes, a lot of teasing. And yeah, so like you know, there's where she's kind of getting on uh, getting on his case about the telescope, and also um, there's a great moment when the Tenth Doctor is kind of cornered uh, into um, singing as a he's introduced as an operatic tenor, and Rose just thinks that's hysterical because she figures, well, the Doctor can't do it. Turns out the doctor can, only we don't get to hear it. It's kind of like, quote unquote, off camera, if you will, that he sings. But he gets applause, so presumably he sang very well. And I loved that bit. I, I you know, because um, first off, it's always interesting to see the psychic uh, papers and how it works and what the right. people see. That's very, very interesting. And so I'm like, okay, that's that's fun. It's kind of interesting that the doctor doesn't quite know what the other person sees. No. So he has to kind of wing it, and, yeah. and kind of like, okay, try, he's because there was a bit where the the doctor was trying to kind of encourage um, what's his name, the uh, Dalyard, yeah. to kind of give away about uh, who he thought the doctor was. And he's yes. trying to coax it out of him, and he doesn't quite give it away. And I thought that was pretty funny. Yeah, um, it. I really liked also the um, when you talked about uh, Rose giving the doctor a hard time. The beach with right, friends, is and, when um, they uh, like when he starts talking about um, the. Uh, you know, the Ch Chevalier, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. Right. about, well, he's such a name dropper. He's always talking about that. <laughs> and she yeah, just good. looks at him like, what? And he's yeah. like, you know, yeah, I was so just telling that to Oscar Wilde. And, and he has no concept that he's doing this. Yeah, yeah. Or or does he? Maybe he's kind of poking fun of himself. Yeah, I didn't, I, could be. I, I wasn't quite sure the way Tennant played that scene. Yeah, but, but really well done. You can tell <laughs> these two guys are loving being back together and doing this. Right. It is yeah. a lot of fun. Yeah, the vibe I got that it just did Billy Piper after the first one kind of settled. I don't I mean, obviously I don't know what order they recorded these in. Right. But um it feels like if this was the second one after a previous one, it feels more like they've kind of settled into their rhythm again. I agree. So, um so yeah, we had the the doctor taking Rose um I guess he's in the mood for something spectacular, and Rose is just like, oh, that's awesome. Let's go. And he ends up taking Rose to Slough, England, which for those who are kind of wondering, it's spelled S-L-O-U-G-H, but it's pronounced Slough. And uh, this is in 1791 where the doctor we talked about takes, him, takes Rose to see William Herschel's 40-foot telescope. Now – this is actually a, a real life telescope that existed, so we, we do have some actual historical basis for this. Um, and the doctor's like praising him for discovering the sixth and seventh moons of Saturn with the telescope, and he's just kind of geeking out over it a little bit. And Rose is just uh, obviously could care less. Yeah, exactly. 
she is just it is she is decidedly unimpressed shall we say it is the and she's not quite this way and i don't mean this in a bad way but the the teenager forced to go right to the science museum or with her parents like yeah with... parents like oh please yeah exactly so uh yeah so she obviously ends up wandering off because hey companions always wander off why do they always wander off yeah, and and so that's where she encounters the Chevalier d'Aeon, who's busy sword fighting. So that's how we kind of get introduced to the Chevalier, who we'll talk about a little bit. Okay. Um, the um, so I kind of liked um, there's a there's a there's a scene where the the um, later in the episode where um, the Doctor and Rose, as they go to their the Chevalier escorts them to this party thrown by Dalyard. Um, it turns out to be a costume party, and I thought that was kind of interesting because the doctor um, chooses a Harlequin costume, which is something I'm going to talk about more of mm-hmm. and later, a uh, little teaser there, and uh, Rose ends up choosing a devil costume, so I thought that was very telling. Yes. And uh, so I thought that was good. And then like we talked about the um, – where Rose in, in is teasing the doctor about seeing – um, and it seemed like, uh, Rose and the Chevalier seemed to get along pretty well. Yes, very much so. Um, they, they really liked, I mean, there was a little chemistry to there. Uh, the Chevalier and, you know, very, yep. very arrogant, very right. confident as well though. Uh, so that was really cool. Yeah, and Rose kind of got her a little bit of highlight where she's she ends up being captured, but because she has the Doctor Sonic screwdriver with her, yeah, uh, she's able to escape and she helps uh, another captive named Darcy, mm-hmm. and they end up freeing all the other captives. So it's not like she's useless in this episode. Yeah, and also um, I love the idea the Doctor kind of without his Sonic screwdriver and having to. You right, know, thinking outside the box, you know, hate to use the cliche, but that's exactly what they're doing. They're trying to figure out, okay, what, what? Yeah. Uh, dang, this would be so much easier if I hadn't given Rose my uh, sonic uh, screwdriver. Yeah, um, that's that's one of the things. The doctor seems to. Be, I know we love the sonic screwdriver. Don't get me wrong, I love yeah. the sonic screwdriver. Sure. But but obviously, it makes things much more difficult for the doctor, and therefore more interesting. When he has to kind of think his way out of a situation more than just relying on the Sonic to just press a button and he's – and something happens. Yes. Uh, that's one of the things I loved about the Peter Davison era um, because early in Davison's run, the, the Sonic screwdriver gets destroyed and Davison is without the Sonic screwdriver for the rest of his run. Mm. So he's kind of has to think more on his feet. Very nice. So I kind of like that a little bit. Uh, all right. Anything else about the Tenth Doctor and Rose before we move on? Nope. Good stuff. Uh, very nice. All right. So the second topic, obviously, is going to be the Chevalier de Aeon, uh, who is an actual historical character, um, and the Doctor kind of gives us some background because obviously this is a bit of a more obscure historical character. I certainly didn't know much about this this person. I knew uh, nothing about it. And... Yeah, but but the Doctor kind of gives a good rundown. Yes. And um, that apparently the we find out that the Chevalier was a ex French spy for Louis the Fifteenth, uh, who just happened to have very androgynous uh, physical characteristics, and the Chevalier um, got in trouble with the French court while working as a spy in England and ended up getting exiled there, but became a very renowned figure in high society. And we find out that after years of living in England, homesick, the Chevalier um, insisted to Louis the Sixteenth, uh, obviously the fifteenth successor, uh, that he was always a woman and only lived as a man for fifty years to satisfy some weird inheritance clause for his father's title. Yes. And the king accepted it with the condition that the Chevalier only wear women's clothes and live her life as a woman. Which apparently the Chevalier must have agreed to, but then Chevalier ended up moving back to England later on. 
So, um, so obviously a very intriguing character, and because uh, because obviously the this character has a spy background, but uh, the Chevalier is is kind of at the um, end of his her life in this, and um, that's a much older now. And that kind of plays into the story. So I want to get your thoughts on the Chevalier in the story. Um, it was really interesting. Um, I After I heard the audio, I went to everyone's favorite Wikipedia yep. and read a little bit more about this. And um, I think whoever the writer really captured – you know, the story of this, that, that um, you know, Wikipedia talks about at the end because um, she or he right. was right. so um, in debt that she would, you know, put on fencing lessons to try to raise money. And so they covered that. They well, I think that it, yeah, that was kind of what – when Rose first spots her, yeah. that's what she's doing. Yeah, and so – um, I like that. Um, you know, one of my favorite parts of the Doctor, and of course, I love everything. Yeah. But when you take a member, a a historical figure, and they um, bring them into the story, right? And especially if it's not as a well known um, character, like you know, it's very cool. We had Shakespeare and. You know, that's kind of nice, but to have something a little bit more obscure is – That you can, that you can learn about it. Yeah, and and the Chevalier worked perfect. Right. Uh, you know, it was just a great um, – you know, very confident, very good at what um, she did, but at the same time um, kind of – the doctor, you know, ended up having to pay for the carriage. Right. And uh, well, she's kind of, well, she's kind of yeah, like a freeloader almost. Yes, it is. Um, yeah, because because she doesn't have money. Right. But she does it with such style, and then uh, you know the doctor gets them into the party, even though um, she's talking about well, you know, obviously I was invited, yeah. and then I just said no because you know I was doing something else. There right. Was Try, a, trying to keep up this pretense. Yes. Yeah. And I once again, as they play, you know, you said that the doctor, um, did he did he know Rose was talking about him or not? I think the way this actor played it, um, it may not even be a pretense for the Chevalier. Um, he, she actually may, you know, really believe what she's saying. Right, right. Yeah. It's just, yeah, just this, you know, the Chevalier's outlook on life yeah. or how how she perceives it Yeah. in this case. Um, one of the things I liked about the, the Chevalier was uh, the doctor had this kind of competition a little bit about being a sword fighter. Yes. That um, – the Doctor, obviously, we know from previous Doctor Who stories, has some sword fighting experience. But um, when urged at, by Rose to kind of duel um, the Chevalier in the street, um, the Doctor ends up losing rather convincingly. Yes. And the Chevalier just pretty much easily uh, defeats the Doctor. And so I thought it was interesting that the Chevalier, even at an older age, is still a better sword fighter than the Doctor. So it just kind of gives the Doctor like, well, okay, maybe like the Doctor isn't as like omnipotent as we'd like to think. Like he does have some failings. Well, and and I think that kind of – because later in the episode they say uh, – you know, the Chevalier says, you were good. You know, I, I'm just better. And right. that was kind of um, – I kind of looked at that as the Chevalier is just 
really good at that, and that's right. why even you know the doctor, and of course so funny, yeah. You know the same guy who taught Errol Finn, Flynn, Errol right. Finn, you know Errol uh, Flynn, yeah, yeah, yeah. That uh, that's how and I like that, that. And, and yeah because Basil Rathbone teaching Errol Flynn and then you know yeah. Basil. Um, now for those who don't know, Basil Rathbone most famous for playing Sherlock Holmes. In yes. Some great uh, Sherlock Holmes movies from the late 30s and 40s, um, but uh, pretty much the definitive Sherlock, at least until maybe Jeremy Brett or uh, Benedict Cumberbatch came along. That um, he, yeah, because um, apparently we found out that's where the Doctor picked up a lot of this. Yes, because says he was taught by Rathbone. And I like the bit at the end, very end, where the doctor is trying to like, hey, uh, Chevalier, tell Rose how much – how great I was at sword fighting. And the Chevalier is just like, well, you're you're passable for an amateur. Yeah. And then the doctor gets kind of a little huffy and is like, well, you can just go buy your own ice cream. Yes, exactly. Which I, I like that a lot. Yeah, I did too. Yeah, I thought that was good. Uh, all right. Uh, anything else about the Chevalier before we move on? No, just a um, it a fun kind of temporary companion, right? Um, just it, and um, the she fit in great. I love the I love the idea that you know the doctor's statement about you know gender is fluid and not to worry about it. Very right. timely with the new doctor coming, isn't it though? Yes. Yeah. And uh, so I, I just, I just thought um, a really enjoyable the chemistry between the three of them, and you could just see picturing in your mind um, Rose smiling at the doctor going back and forth with Chevalier. Yeah, I think this would have made a, a good TV episode. Yes, so. I think so too. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's move on to our third topic, and that is going to be uh, Joxer and Hempel, who are essentially two parts of a three-faced being, uh, what the doctor refers to as a tri-sentient being, although we don't get an actual alien race named. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, it turns out that uh, the um, this uh, Joxer and Hempel – are a uh, some slave traders, and so that kind of makes them obviously the big bad of the story. So I want to get your thoughts on this rather unusual character. Great villain. You um, liked it, yeah. Like truly, them, I should say, truly evil. Um, you know, a simple bad guy that, um, you know, I. I I did love they, – they did a good job of explaining, um, since it's a audio drama, of, you know, the two different voices we heard. And, you know, right. they're like, oh, you were male. Now you're female. Um, the – and the whole callousness of humans are just so – uh, we have too many of them, so if we ma let's create a scarcity, right? And that way, you know, we're just enough people that we can still breed, and um, you know, just you're like, wow, what a um, truly evil villain! Uh, right? Yeah, I, I liked them a lot. I love their arrogance. Um, I thought they were gonna give me a twist. Uh, when they shared that they take orders from only people that are superior to them and they would not uh, – and, and they've never found anyone superior, I immediately said, okay, well, they don't realize he's Gallifreyan and a Time Lord. Right. He's going to show that, and then they're going to have to obey him. And then when Chevalier – did a duel, I thought that was how they were going to. I was like, oh, they didn't go the obvious. They're going to go that Chevalier wins, therefore they have to obey him. Um, no, they cheated, but then they went to where I was going to go. So I'm slightly disappointed, 
yeah. but not total. I mean, I think it was a realistic ending, and it was good. Yeah, and I thought the Chevalier was a li- coming off as a little overconfident in that scene, yeah. so I was so I wasn't necessarily surprised that the uh, the Chevalier would lose, or at yeah. least had that that basically that the um, Jockster and Hempel wouldn't consider the Chevalier to be their superior. But uh, obviously, when the doctor steps up and is like, "Okay, scan me," I'm sure I'm, I'm just like, "Okay, this is it." Yeah, exactly. And, then, and then I kind of figured out that, oh yeah, they're gonna they're gonna have to follow the doctor, and which of course they do. The doctor ends up telling, ordering them to kind of um, to um, was it that, that they they have to go um, return all the slaves and then find all the ones they sold previously and then rescue them. So I thought that was gonna like okay, let's just go even more retroactively that you have to go back and find all the all the all the people that you sold. Um, yes. And apparently they have no choice in the matter because they, this is like a like a an, an official command that they have to follow this by their code, I guess. So and the doctor points out like yeah, this isn't like this is really a, um, a really dumb way to do it. <laughs> Yeah. Their 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 life there's um, system, so I thought that was interesting. Yeah, we we find out that they're like uh, belong to this group called the Consortium of the Obsidian Asp, which is explained as a loose affiliation of intergalactic criminals, or as Rose puts it more succinctly, a space mafia. Yeah. Now, were you? Um, have we heard of this uh, group before the mafia? No, no, no. This is, I think, something pretty new. At least not, not that I'm aware of. Maybe okay. if they, if they appeared in some other big finish audios, I didn't hear about it. So as far as I know, this is this is pretty new char- These are pretty new characters. Okay. But um, yeah, it's this is a really interesting alien race. We find out that like three beings inhabit one body, and it turns out that one of them's dead. So they kind of like lug this third persona around this third face even though like the other two are still living and it'll just be that way until there's one and then the until the one finally dies i guess so just a just really interesting race i thought did um do you have a feeling on why they wanted to have the three of them but have one of them dead I think it's just more to play off the male female because okay. they had a male and female voice to kind of juxtapose against the chevalier. Okay. Who who kind of facilitated back and forth between male and female roles. Yeah. And I guess what I just was surprised is why then they didn't just have them a dual um you know fam- yeah. a, a dual personality. Right. But yeah. Yeah, I just th- I just thought they would Maybe they thought it would have been a little too obvious by just having a, a dual alien. Yeah. Okay. So they so they went with a third, but we'll just you know like okay, the third one's dead, so that's why right. there's only two voices, I guess. Okay. Uh, that's my guess. I don't know. All right, no, I, mean, I think just, that's I'm, a good guess. I'm just speculating here, okay. and I thought it was interesting because these were slave traders. They kind of um, played that off against the setting of the time period in 1791. And the doctor points out, I think it was to um, the Dalyard, to Dalyard that um, is like, okay, you're upset about the the, the slave trading, and this, that's what you guys do here in this century. So, yes, absolutely. So I thought that was good because obviously the doctor is understandably outraged. So yeah, the doctor gets to be outraged once again yes. over over this the slave trading, and takes steps to uh, address it. So. Okay. But uh, yeah, thought it was thought it was good. Um, anything else about uh, this this Jockster and Hempel? No, no. I, I think they were great and uh, very happy. All right, sounds good. Okay, so uh, do you, anything else about the episode before we move on? Um, I like I said, it was a really good story. I thought that they um, it was entertaining. I um, I, I liked the setting. I liked the uh, interaction between the characters it was just a really uh solid episode yeah i agree i totally agree yeah. all right so uh you have some best lines of the episode well since i listened to it in the car no right. I didn't. so okay. but please. all right that's yes. all right no problem yeah. I, I have a few here 
Um, I have uh, this exchange between Rose and the Doctor. Most of these, are, I think, are I think all of these are of Rose and the Doctor. So, um, so Rose starts off uh, criticizing the Doctor because they interrupted this wedding uh, on what is it? Uh, this planet called uh, was it? Uh, I can't remember the name. The um, oh shoot! Oh well, I thought I had it. Oh, but Beltraxi, that's it. Okay. Okay, so so Rose is talking about that. She says, "Nobody jump bungee jumps to their wedding, Doctor. Nobody. The priest fainted." The Doctor replies, "Did he? I probably just a coincidence." <laughs> Rose, 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 Rose responds, "No, it was definitely the screaming idiots gate crashing the wedding head first. And the Doctor's like, "I caught the bouquet," and Rose says, "In your teeth." Yes. <laughs> the doctor replies. The Doctor replies, "Well." You know me, never one to show off. Yeah. So I thought that was good. Uh, another exchange between Rose and the doctor. Um, Rose is trying to get her bearings. She says, 1791, let me get my bearings. Quarter to Pride and Prejudice. The doctor replies, yeah, yeah. Half past Black Adder Series 3. The Regency. Love the Regency. Can't beat a good wig. <laughs> which is a nice nod because if you're a Black Adder fan, uh, which I am, that's you know the show that stars Rowan Atkinson, and uh, I'm a big fan of that series. So that was that was a nice little nod. Uh, the third exchange between Rose and the Doctor, the where um, they're talking about the Chevalier in this one. Rose says she's very nice, just a bit, you know. The doctor replies, unable to talk about anyone but herself. I swear she's making half of it up. She can't have possibly met all the people she claims to. Rose says, hmm, people like that, pain, aren't they? The doctor replies, I know, name droppers, awful. My old pal Oscar Wilde's just the same. Yeah, uh, that that was the one. I am so glad you wrote that down because I was like, Dang it, I need to write that because that says so much beautiful about the, the doctor. It, it, is, it, it does, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, the final exchange I have between Rose and the doctor where uh, doctor says, uh, you heard it. It's forced to serve anything it considers superior. Terrible way to run a culture, though. Rose says, don't knock it. The doctor replies, well, it's stupid, though, isn't it? It's bound to get you into trouble. Rigid thinking and rigid self-identity. That is no way to get ahead in the universe. Embrace change. It's the only way. Yes, absolutely. So good words of wisdom there from the doctor, uh, especially when it regards the upcoming 13th doctor, Jody Whitaker. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I just it was great. Uh, so much fun. Um, yeah, and good quotes, sir. Good quotes. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Well, I didn't obviously write them. I just wrote them down. So, yeah. All right. So what's your rating for this episode? You know, I give this um, nine out of ten gender fluid swordsmen. Very nice. Swords persons. There you go. Um, the uh, – I'm a little you – know, so you really like this one. Uh, I do. I'm, a, I'm just a little bit under you. I give it eight and a half swift rapiers. Ooh, very nice. So because in honor of the Chevalier's very uh, fast rapiers, uh, swords. Um, okay, so um, we have a reverse the polarity segment. Nice. Which, um, as I referenced to – teased a little bit earlier in the episode – so we're going to go back to this week, as we reverse the polarity of the neutron flow, back to 1982 with season 19, uh, the fifth serial of that season called Black Orchid. And this is written by Terrence Dudley. And in this one, uh, we go to 1925 England, where the TARDIS materializes at a railway station and the crew encounter uh, – this Lord Cranley chauffeur uh, who's been expecting a person known as the doctor, but it's kind of vague about who the doctor is. The doctor, of course, assumes it's him. 
and uh, poses as that person. Lord Cranley asks them to stay until the annual ball, which turns out to be, you guessed it, a costume ball. Ooh, nice. And they're introduced to Anne Talbot, Lord Cranley's fiance, who looks identical to the doctor's companion, Nyssa. So when Tegan, the doctor's other companion, admires a black flower, uh, Lady Cranley explains that it's a black orchid and was found on the Orinoco by her son, George. And Tegan recognizes the name as George Cranley, a famous botanist and explorer. Lady, So this is another historical episode. Uh, just kind of like the Sword of the Chevalier. Uh, Lady Cranley uh, says that George never returned from his expedition into the Brazilian forest. So, and uh, Anne also was uh, engaged to George. So um, the, end of the doctor, Nyssa, and Tegan, and Adric go to this party. And the doctor picks, you guessed it, a Harlequin outfit. Ooh, okay. So I thought so I thought that the the doctor picking a Harlequin outfit in Florida the Chevalier was a very nice reference to Black Orchid. Yeah. Someone someone did their homework. Uh so the doctor they go to the ball and comes to their room presenting Nissa with a butterfly dress identical to her own because Nissa and Anne look exactly alike and the ball attendees will won't be able to tell them apart. Ooh, okay. So, so there's kind of like, okay, which one's which kind of going on. So the doctor, as the doctor prepares for the ball, a, a figure enters his room from a secret passage. The figure takes the doctor's Harlequin costume and enters the party, posing as the the Harlequin, grabs Anne by the wrist. Anne screams for help, and a doctor rushes, or a butler rushes to her assistance. The the Harlequin strangles the butler, causing Anne to faint. Lord Cranley ends up finding the dead butler in Anne's mask, and the doctor shows up later wearing the Harlequin costume, ready for the party, and, fi- and, and Anne ends up identifying him as the attacker. So we get a like a – the doctor is mistaken for the murderer going on. Uh, the doctor proclaims his innocence, uh, suggesting that someone else has an identical costume, but Anne states there was only one Harlequin costume. So Robert questions the doctor regarding his identity, this this law enforcement officer. Um, the doctor explains that he's a time lord and he travels in time and space. So he just comes right out and ex- says, this is why. It couldn't have been me. Uh, the doctor invites Sir Robert and a police sergeant into the TARDIS. So to kind of as proof and astounded by what he sees, Sir Robert offers the doctor an apology, but is obviously still concerned about the murder and who the real murderer is. The doctor uses the TARDIS, returning them to Cranley Hall just in time because the secret room that um, where the mysterious figure came from is suddenly ablaze with a fire started by the deformed figure who breaks out, goes to the main hall where Lord and Lady Cranley are talking. The figure grabs hold of Nyssa, mistaking her for Anne, drags her upstairs to the roof. Sir Robert demands to know who the deformed figure is, and Lady Cranley – explains that it's her mad son, George, who is actually alive and whose injuries were caused by indigenous Brazilians who removed his tongue because they held the black orchid to be sacred. So apparently George went a little nuts in the process. Uh, Lord Cranley and the doctor climb to the roof to confront George. The doctor implores him to release Nyssa, uh, telling him to look down below, and who's in, which he does, and sees Anne down below. Realizing that he doesn't have the right girl, uh, persuades George to release Nyssa. George's brother, Lord Cranley, approaches to thank approaches George to thank him, but George ends up recoiling in horror and falls off the roof to his death. Before the doctor departs, uh, Anne gives Tegan and Nyssa their costumes as presents, and Lady Cranley presents the doctor with a copy of George's book about the Black Orchid. So. Oh wow! Very nice. I like that. Yeah. So Sounds that's uh, good. Yeah, it's a good episode. It's a little, and it's a short little two episode, so it only comes out to like forty five minutes. So that's a good modern day style uh, TV story. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, it's very cool. We're, I definitely recommend it. Obviously, being a Fifth Doctor fan, definitely would encourage that one. So um, we do have some feedback this week. Oh, thank you. Please can't wait to hear it. Yeah, so we have um, two feedbacks. 
Uh, one from a Stephanie Marie Freine, who was kind enough to write to us on Facebook. And Stephanie writes, uh, after 2.5 years of wanting to watch Doc Classic Who, I was listening to an episode and someone mentioned BritBox. Uh, she says this was from an older episode. I listened to them while I'm running, by the way. Uh, almost a year of episodes are missing off iTunes. I know, right? There's a bunch of episodes missing off iTunes uh, from Classic Who. Uh, she says, well, I signed up today and starting to watch The Mark of the Ronnie. So thanks for all the great information and tips on what to watch. So you're very welcome, Stephanie. Glad to, glad we can help you out. Yeah, thanks, Stephanie. That is so, lovely. So, yeah, so if you're in a mood for some classic coup and iTunes doesn't quite cut it for you, um, check out BritBox, the uh, streaming service, because apparently they have all the classic coup episodes. Well, good. That is very uh -huh. nice to know. Yeah, yeah, so check those out. Um, so thanks, Stephanie, and thanks for listening. Yeah. Uh, we, we also have some feedback from Paul from Australia. Thank you, Paul. As always. Uh, who writes it about the Sword of the Chevalier. He says, Hi, Charles and Jesse. I enjoy listening to this story. I can't believe how easy Tennant slips back into character. Billy's Rose sounds slightly different, but you, you were right that after a while you forget about it. I love the interaction between her and the Doctor, just like old times. I giggle when they arrived on Earth in 1791 to look at the 40-foot telescope, which apparently doesn't work. And the doctor describes the era as, quote, one fourth, one quarter to Pride and Prejudice and one half past Blackadder. Um, actually, it was Rose who said it was quarter till Pride and Prejudice, but I get your point. Um, the uh, Paul continues, it's fun to, when they meet the Chevalier and we all know how the doctor prides himself with his fencing. And even though he loses to her in a duel, he loses graciously with a line – Pleasure to be your pin cushion. That was a good line. Yeah, it was. Uh, I found the consortium of the Asidian Asp intriguing. The Space Mafia, as Rose puts it, are estranged with their dual voices and three faces. I want to know how the third one died. Ooh, yeah, good point. G good question. Uh, one thing that confused me was that if the slate trade with humans was so profitable, why would they want to wipe out the population of Earth with Vorlock poison? Did I miss something? No. That's actually a good point. Like uh, maybe they figure, well, we can go somewhere else and get slaves. So Yeah, and I what I got the feeling is they were saying that they would make them even more valuable if there were less of them. Right, because of the rarity. The yes, right. I got you. Okay, so uh, Paul says, anyway, the resolution happens really fast with the villains having to – do what the doctor says after determining that he is superior to them. Uh, what a strange race they are. It was fun hearing that the consortium were using localized transmats, such a fun staple of whose history. I totally agree. Um, I was on the edge of my seat when the doctor thought was thought to be an operatic tenor and was forced to hear, forced to perform for a second. I thought we might hear him sing, but no, alas, it was cleverly edited to alter or to after the supposed performance. Great fun. Ooh, good. Hope you guys enjoyed it too. Sending my kindest regards, Kenneth's wishes to you both. Take care of Paul. P.S. Okay, Charles and Jesse, I know where we're going next. <laughs> I'm looking, yeah, you figured it out, didn't you? Uh, and I'm looking forward to it as usual, but it's not official till Charles says it. Over to you. Why, well, thank you, Paul. <laughs> All right. Oh, I so, love this. So next time, a next stop everywhere. As Paul so astutely guessed it, we're going to talk about Cold Vengeance, the third CD and final CD from Big Finish's Doctor Who, The Tenth Adventures Volume 2 set, uh, starring David Tennant and Billy Piper. And this one I'm looking forward to because it features the return of the Ice Warriors. Ooh. So an actual, like, classic Who baddie, uh, voiced, of course, by Nicholas Briggs. Uh, probably with his kind of more modern take on the Ice Warrior. So I'm definitely looking forward to that. Uh, yeah, I am too. By the way, um, side note, after our last recording, yes. I pulled up an Amazon uh, on um, – uh, I 
Amazon, I think, Prime. Yeah, and um, okay. watch Doomsday again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, I had yeah, to watch it. Yeah, Amazon Prime has some, yeah. uh, the Modern Who episodes. Yeah, I just had to, after our last discussion, I yep. was missing Rose and uh, the Doctor, so I watched Doomsday, and it was so did, much fun. Did you have a good cry? I did. It was really, <laughs> really nice, yes. Um, yeah, so very cool. Well, hey, Charles. Yes. Um, hey, Jesse. If people want to be like the cool kids and give us feedback, how can they? Well, if you want to be like Paul from Australia or Stephanie uh, Marie Friday on Facebook, uh, you can reach us at uh, Next Stop SMG on the Twitter machine, or you can reach us on Facebook at Next Stop Everywhere, the Doctor Who podcast. Or you can email us, as Paul did, at Next Stop Everywhere, SMG, don't forget the SMG, at gmail.com. And Jesse, where can they find you on the interwebs? Well, I am on Twitter at Jesse Jackson DFW. I am on Set Lusting Bruce, is my other podcast. Um, hey, the drinking game. I don't think I mentioned Bruce this episode. I uh, know. How, just now. How, do we, how, do, how do we get through that? Yeah. How weird is that? Um, <laughs> You're slipping. Yes. Um, and also coming up uh, on the in the next couple of weeks on the Great Albums podcast, um, the guys had me on and we talked. I talked. No, not a Bruce Springsteen album, but I talked Paul Simon's Graceland. Ooh, that's a good album. Um, yeah, it was a very good album, and uh, but I made the joke that um, I said if you listen to my Doctor Who podcast, my partner in uh, time always says the drinking game should be take a drink anytime I mention Bruce. So as I was discussing Graceland, there were a couple of times I mentioned Bruce, and they started saying take a drink. Take it. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, yes. Um, I am also on Facebook. And um, so uh, please and go to, as Charles said, our Next Stop Everywhere Facebook page could use some more likes. And go to iTunes to rate and review us. We really do need some love there. Charles and I are insecure. We, we, need, <laughs> we need the positive reinforcement. Yep. Uh, Charles, uh, you and I, before we hit record, we were talking a little bit about Krypton. Yes. So isn't there an epi isn't there another podcast you do where you talk about all kinds of uh, genre TV stuff? I see what you did there, Jesse. Uh, yes, why? Yes, there is. Uh, it's called the Phantom Zone Podcast, where we talk about we've been talking about Krypton for the past couple of weeks, and we're going to talk about the third episode in our upcoming episode. Um, so we'll be doing that, but. Um, if you want to get a hold of me, you can reach me at Charles Skaggs on the Twitter machine or at Charles Skaggs on the Instagram. Google Plus for all you crazy kids of the Google Plus. Shout out to Karen. And um, Facebook, of course, at Charles Skaggs. And my blog at Geeky Things. If I can press the button. Damn good coffee. And hot. <laughs> Damn good coffee and hot. Where I talk about all Doctor Who... Uh, Torchwood, Big Finish Audios, and of course all kinds of comic book and sci-fi news goodness. And um, the uh, my other podcast that I do with you, Jesse, uh, Titan Talk, the Titans podcast, which we're going to have to probably record next week here um, as soon yes. as we figure out what we're going to talk about um, for our sixth episode. But um, we're going to have we're going we talk about. Uh, all the kind of DC Comics Titans as we and also we building up to the Titans TV series uh, that's coming soon from the uh, DC's digital service, DC Comics digital service that'll be coming out. Perfect. So we talk about that. And then, of course, the Phantom Zone podcast that I mentioned and what I do with friend of the show, Karen Lindsay. And then, of course, Ghost with the Twin Peaks podcast. They do with Zan Sprouse, wife of comic book artist Chris Sprouse, where I talk about all things Twin Peaks. So please check those out. I would definitely appreciate it and um, hope you enjoy them. Indeed, indeed. And, uh, yeah, definitely check out Titan Talk because Jesse and I do that as well. And we uh, want to share our enthusiasm for the Titans and the various Titans characters. All right. So um, come on back, everybody. 
for Cold Vengeance as we wrap things up. Not quite sure yet what we're going to talk about after that. So, Jesse, if you got some ideas, start brainstorming. Okay, I will. And, and uh, But do we have a quote to uh, lead us out? We do. Um, in honor of Rose um, and the doctor, Rose having and the doctor not having, I'm going to quote the doctor when he says, Oh, yes, harmless is just the word. That's why I like it. Doesn't kill, doesn't wound, doesn't main, but I'll tell you what it does do. It is very good at opening doors. Excellent quote. Yes, very nice. Uh, and where's that from? That is actually from Doomsday. Oh, cool. Um, and, when, and so I was like, wait a minute. We, we, I thought that was perfect considering you know he did not have his um, sonic screwdriver this time. Yeah, very okay. fitting. Very fitting. Yeah. All right. So uh, thanks, everybody, for listening to Next Stop Everywhere. We always appreciate you uh, listening and, and sending in feedback and whatnot. Uh, come on back. We're going to talk about Cold Vengeance as we wrap up The Tenth Doctor and Rose. Uh, hopefully we'll get some more episodes from those two. But in the meantime, uh, have fun out there in time and space, and we'll see you in two weeks. Bye, everybody. Bye.